All praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of all the worlds. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the evil of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, no one can lead him astray. And whoever Allah leads astray, there's no one that can guide him. Continue where we left off from Kitab al-Iman, the book of faith from Sahih al-Bukhari. The next hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned another sign of faith and a sign of hypocrisy. The chapter is titled, To Love the Ansar is a Sign of Faith. Anasin, radiallahu anhu, anin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qala, ayatul imani, hubbul ansari, wa ayatul nifaqi, bughd al ansari. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, to love the Ansar is a sign of faith, and to hate the Ansar is a sign of Iman. This hadith collected in Bukhari, between Imam al-Bukhari and the narrator, there are four people. This Isnad is Ali, few people in the chain. And this is one of the blessings of the earlier books of hadith that we find the Isnad al-Ali, which means there are few people between the narrator of the hadith and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this hadith is a hadith with only four people. And there are some hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that are known as Thuluthiyat, which means between Imam al-Bukhari and between the Prophet, there are only three people. Now the Ansar in Islam are those people who help the Prophet. Those people who help the Prophet, help the religion of Al-Islam, and so forth. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ayatul Iman that a clear indication, a clear sign of faith is that a person he loves, the Ansar. These Ansar, they struggled with their wealth, they struggled with their life. So this hadith encourages us to love the Ansar and it highlights their virtue. Ibn Rajab al-Hambali, rahimahullah, he mentioned that this hadith's meaning, it goes back to the hadith previously mentioned before it, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that a person, he loves someone only for Allah's sake. And when this exists, then the sweetness of Iman is inside that person's heart, is that he has love and he has respect for those who aid the religion. So likewise, we love the companions. The companions are included in this as well, as well as the muhajireen. Abdul Haq al Hashimi, he said, after Bukhari mentioned the previous hadith about how we interact with Allah and His Messenger, he followed it up with showing how we should feel towards the companions. And this hadith specifically mentions the Ansar because they were dearer to the Prophet. From this hadith, we learn that a sign of Iman in a person's heart is that he loves the Ansar and a sign of hypocrisy in a person's heart is that he hates the Ansar. The next hadith is narrated on Ubaidah ibn Samit radiallahu anhu who took part in the battle of Badr and was a naqib, a person heading a group of six persons. On the night of Al-Uqba pledge, Allah's messenger said, while a group of his companions were around him, Give me the bayah, give me the pledge for one, not joining anything in worship along with Allah. Two, not to steal. Three, not to commit illegal sexual intercourse. Four, not to kill your children. Five, not to utter slander intentionally by forging falsehood. And six, not to be disobedient when ordered to do ma'roof other good deeds. This hadith Imam Bukhari mentioned, it shows us that avoiding sins, he mentioned six things, that avoiding sins is from Iman, the same way following Allah's command is. After giving the pledge, he prohibited him from sinning. This hadith is agreed upon, meaning it's collected in Bukhari and Muslim with the same narrator of Sahaba.
This hadith, it is a refutation. It is a rejection against those who say a person who commits major sins is a kafir. Or a person who commits major sins will remain in the hellfire forever. Why? Because at the end of that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whoever amongst you fulfills his pledge will be rewarded by Allah. And whoever indulges is any one of these sins gets the punishment in this world. That punishment will be an expiation for that sin. And if one indulges in any one of them and Allah conceals his sin, it is up to him to forgive him or punishment. In the end of that hadith, we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that anyone who indulges in these sins, he gets a punishment in this world. And that punishment will be an expiation, meaning that a person who steals, what's the punishment? His hand is cut off. A person who commits adultery, fornication, either he's lashed if he wasn't married, and he's stoned if he was married before. This is an expiation for those sins. And if it is not known to the people, meaning Allah conceals it, covers it up for him, then his affairs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, he can forgive him if he wills, or he can punish him in the hereafter. This hadith, as Ibn Mulakin mentioned, the person who dies without having repented for sins, then his affairs left with Allah. Either he will be punished, or he will be forgiven. This hadith, it mentions four cardinal sins, the kabair, in regards to Allah's rights, and the rights of his servants about wealth, private parts, and blood. al amir al-San'ani, he said this hadith mentions prohibitions and not the commands because the commands are included in the words not to be disobedient. And Allah's Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told him not to join partners with Allah, not to steal, not to commit sexual, illegal sexual intercourse, not to kill your children, and not to order slander, and not to be disobedient. Because it is easier to refrain from doing something than it is to do it. Ibn Malakin, he said this hadith was mentioned after the Ansar because the Ansar became Muslim before the people mentioned in this hadith. And last point, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali he mentioned that this hadith, it shows that capital punishment and other penalties legislated in Islam serve as an expiation. So a person who's punished in this dunya by the legislated penalties, then it is an expiation. Now, should a person confess his sins if he committed zina, if he stole? Should he confess it? Ibn Rajab, he said, the majority of the scholars say if he repents, then it is better for him to remain silent and keep his toll, but his repentance between him and Allah. Now, if he has stolen property, then he should try to return it back to the person who it was stolen from, if he has the ability to. Imam al-Shafi'i said that this was the view of Abu Bakr, Umar, and Abdullah bin Mas'ud, that if a person commits a major sin, such as zina, then he shouldn't confess it to people in front of a judge. However, a known sinner, a person who is a habitual sinner, he should confess and go to the judge for the expiation. And that's one of the things, one of the problems you find people who fall into zina, wa'udhu billah, is that they become addicted to it. They can't stop. They keep doing it and doing it and doing it. That they become so addicted to it, to it destroys them. al khatabi said, in regards to falsely accusing or uttering slander, buhtan, it refers to accusing a chaste person of zina, or lying on people, or backbiting, or even accusing them of something they're free from. In other words, al-buhtan is to lie on a person saying that he has committed a certain act in order to tarnish his honor. And the six benefits we take from this hadith is one, legal punishment, legal penalties legislated in Islam are expiations for sins. Two, punishment in the next life for a sin is left to Allah. Three, major sinners can attain intercession. Major sinners can attain intercession. We don't say major sinners are in hell because they are under the will of Allah. Number four, avoiding sins and prohibitions are from the signs of Iman. Number five, 
We should trust in Allah for our provisions and be content with his qadr. And number six, we have to abandon bad habits. We have to abandon bad traits before we can achieve good character. Wasapanakalahumu wa bihamdika, ashadu wa la ilaha la ant, astagfiruka wa tubu ilayk.